Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs unlocked success and how their stories can help you do the same. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason has built multi million dollar businesses that have been featured in Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. His life's mission now is helping entrepreneurs live what he calls hashtag the exit lifestyle. Introducing TEDx speaker, mastermind leader, author, entrepreneur, cigar aficionado, motorcycle enthusiast, and host of the root of all success, the real Jason Duncan. The real real Jason Jason Duncan. Duncan. Welcome to episode 102 of The Root of All Success. I am the real Jason Duncan. Thank you for tuning in today. We've got a guest all the way from France today. He's actually not French. He's an American, but he's been on a 29 country world tour with his family over the last couple of years. He's visited 29 countries. He's spending time hanging out with the people that he loves the most. And, uh, He is a successful guy and he talks about what that means to him about being genuinely happy. And that's what he's been able to accomplish. He set up his business to run in a way that he doesn't have to be involved in the day to day. And that might sound familiar as we get into this. What you're going to see is that he's got these seven particular things that he teaches about how entrepreneurs like you can get out of the weeds of daily operations. And you're going to find, if you know and follow my content, that his seven steps and my four steps that I teach are very similar. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the steps completely overlap in a couple of places. And this means that it's possible to get yourself out of the weeds. It is possible to not work 80 hours a week. And if you're in the car right now driving to the office and you're a little bit wondering why you have to do that every day after all these years of owning that business, then you need to pay attention to what Jeff's going to talk about today. And then also there's going to be an offer at the end that you might could take advantage of. Jeff's going to offer you a free 30 minute strategy session to see what you might be able to do to get past some of those obstacles. And of course, um, there, there's opportunities abound. Uh, there are abounding opportunities everywhere for you to figure that stuff out. So I'm glad that you're listening today. Thank you for being here. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeff. So Jeff Davis, he's an entrepreneur, of course, um, and he's going to tell a story today on the show about how he worked every day, all day long, every night, every weekend, 80 plus hours a week he was working to giving all that up and starting to travel the world and visiting 29 countries with his family. And he attributes that ability to go from that over overworked, um, no happiness, no success, all of that to a life of leisure and still making the money that he needs to cover his bills and be able to travel by focusing on doing these seven particular things, which we're going to talk about at the end of the show. And when he he teaches this and he says, when entrepreneurs go through and commit to these seven sta- seven steps, they can dramatically uh, build scalable businesses that don't that don't need them and to get out of the weeds so they can pursue other passions in life. He's the founder and chairman of a national community of entrepreneurs and CEOs called 12 Mavens. He started a uh, an event called Plan the Attack. He's going to talk about how he decided to start that event after going on a little introspection retreat by himself, if you, if you, if it, as it were. Um, but he helps pull back the curtain on these seven steps every day through 12 Mavens, which is a peer group for entrepreneurs and CEOs. And uh, Jeff is just a fantastic guy. We have a lot in common. We have a great, we have a great conversation on the show today. So please help me welcome Jeff Davis. Jeff, welcome to the show, my man. I'm pumped to be here. All the way from France. So you're not even here in the States with us today. So you're you're traveling, doing that. What is it? 29 countries. Is that what you're on this two year journey? We've, we've already been to all 29. We're take we're taking a victory lap right now. So when are you heading back or you or, or what are you going to do? Know. Don't know. All right, folks, listen to this. This guy that we're going to be talking to today in this show. And I probably already said this in intro, but like. He and I do a lot of the same stuff and he's living his version of what I would call the exit lifestyle with his family traveling the world. I'm not a world traveler. I'd rather get in my RV and just drive somewhere. He He's flying, but <laughs> you're going to love this show because Jeff, Jeff and I don't know each other, but uh, that's the cool thing about doing this podcast is you get to meet some cool people. So Jeff, um, so tell me just who are you? Just introduce yourself, like tell everybody who you are, what you do. Yeah, life 
lifelong entrepreneur uh, always started some kind of thing since I was a kid, even though I didn't realize what I was doing. I just would like something and I'd turn it into something, you know, when I was in my early twenties, I love skateboarding and I, I found a wood manufacturer and then I started uh, calling every skate shop in America with the, the skateboards out of my little apartment. Um, uh, I, you know, anytime I've been passionate about something, I, I, I turned it into some kind of a business. Um, uh, other than that, lousy, lousy guitar player. <laughs> and I like going to places. <laughs> so skateboarding uh, was kind of your thing early on and mm -hmm. uh, lousy guitar player. So you and I have another, we were talking pre-show about how many things we have in common down to our yeah. initials and yeah. our, yeah. our assistants, both are named Megan and <laughs> Yeah, we do yeah, the same I mean, kind of thing. Yeah, it probably keeps going. And by the way, um, I'm an old dude now, but I still watch skating videos on YouTube almost every day. <laughs> well, like I, I'm not much into skateboarding. I know who Tony Hawk is, but isn't he like in his 40s now? Yeah, like, he's yeah. It helps to have him older than me. That helps yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm I'm happy that I have people like, like Brad Pitt and Clooney are just forever be older than me. So I can always be like, well, they're 60. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think about stuff like that, too, because I'm, I'm 47. So as I get older, I'm looking at I'm looking at these uh, these dudes that are still they've got it. They're still looking good. They're still in shape. They're still doing, you know, they're, they're successful and they just don't look like an old dude. They don't look like a dad. You know, they just, they're just like an old and I'm like, okay, there's hope. There's hope. Yeah. We got hope. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love these Instagram memes that shows the, these side-by-side -side pictures of a guy who's, who's 60 and another guy who's 60. And they, just, one looks like yeah. what you would imagine a 60 year old looks like with the, you know, the ridiculous clothes, a huge gut. And and then you got the other guy who looks ripped and like, OK, I got to I got to aim for that second guy. <laughs> yeah, it's it is amazing when you see a picture like an old black and white photo of somebody with white hair and everything. And you realize they're probably younger than you or, or whatever. You know, it's pretty crazy. It's different. You know, people say, you know, with the, with the with the life average lifespan stretching out so much that it is a different thing now. But then, but then you also hear, like I heard Bill Burr the other day say, people say, fifth, uh, you know, 50 is the new 40. No, it's 50. That's <laughs> but right. I don't know. But I, but I don't know, man. Uh, uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping to, to beat all the odds and, and still look and act way younger for a long time. You and me both, man. You and me both. So what did you do? Uh, what was your first, I guess, official? Yeah, I use that word official loosely, but business what was your first official business was it the yeah i'm not thing? sure how, it, this one first one kind of teeters on official because i did do transactions and i did have customers all over america but it also was i wouldn't say that official was that skateboard business where i, I cold called i mean I, I was doing all these things that i didn't know what they were called like i was mailing letters to skate shops and i realized that was like direct response marketing and and that was calling them all. And I didn't know that's called cold calling. Um, uh, and I was in just doing the, that stuff, but I was, I would impel helping my way through college in between classes. I would sit there in my crappy little apartment and I'd, I'd cold call every skate shop in America and sell boards all over the country. Um, and then uh, I did that until I just didn't want to do it anymore, you know, after a while. And then uh in 2003, uh, I was passionate about drawing. I could draw pretty well, but I didn't want to be a starving artist. And I started a company that did medical illustrations for trial lawyers. And so it, like you think about a, a, like a case where somebody has been injured or they've had a surgery um, and my business would visually communicate the details of that case for them in an easier to understand, more compelling way. And uh, that was the first like real, real business where I started scaling that and I started hiring people and I had an office and, and, and going to conferences and grew that to law firms across about 40 States around the country. Um, and at, at one point grew it to where we had like, to a two story office in the middle of downtown with all these employees everywhere doing all this stuff. Um, and I started that in a, in a little 500 square foot studio apartment. 
uh, it was apartment 1104, but I called it sweet 1104 on my business, on my first business cards. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, man. That was my anthem. <laughs> me too. Me too. Well, you know, again, you know, I'm a lousy guitarist. I didn't mention that earlier. I was about to mention that. So we got a lot of this in comment. I'm also somewhat of an artist, got accepted to two art colleges and wanted to design cars for a living. Ended up going into ministry instead, which is a whole other story that for, I could tell on somebody else's show, not yours, not this show. But but uh, you turned your artistic ability into a significant business in such a weird little niche. How did how in the world did that become a possibility and an opportunity to draw medical stuff for lawyers? Yeah, for it was trials? pretty intentional, actually. Like I, I I knew I wanted to draw stuff but I didn't want to be a starving artist. And I started asking around and doing research and I found out about medical illustration. And then I found out about medical illustration more specifically for litigation. Cause there's always a case they have a budget, you know? And so I started doing that. And I mean, I actually went to school for it and got a, a degree in it, which is a whole nother story. Dissecting human cadavers uh, is on, on my, uh, my little <laughs> resume, I guess. But uh, but uh, but then I got it to where, you know, I, I was more it was funny because I had that degree in it, but I was like way more into the marketing and the sales and uh, and building a business. I if, right almost from the, the very beginning, I was wanting to build a scalable business that I could sell. I wanted a business that could work with or without me like pretty early on. And you did sell that. You sold that to a biotech firm yeah. uh, in 2014, right? That's right. So that's congratulations to you. So they they even went uh, became public a public company right after they yeah. Uh, bought you. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I took in place of a, a, a bit of the cash. I took uh, uh, shares and ownership of the bigger company that I sold to, and still own a tiny little piece. I usually say a tiny little piece and I let the high pitch indicate that it's, it's a small percentage, but, uh, but I, I took some shares um, for the bigger company. So when you sold that in 2014, what was the next big entrepreneur move for you? What did you do next? Yeah. Um, for me, it, it was, uh, I was already daydreaming and fantasizing about this little cool community of, of entrepreneurs that could help each other out and serve as each other's little confidential think tank and, and meet together and hold each other accountable and, and, and do like, I imagined having like this event and I guess kind of backing it up a little bit. So on, on that, you know, cause people can hear a thing and be like, Oh wow, he started the thing. And now it's in 40 States and yay. But, but like, there's so much pain and suffering, you know, from that day one to the exit on the way and, and learning things the hard, painful way. And I was working every night. I was working every weekend. I mean, 3 AM, 4 AM with a suit and tie coming or going to that office mm. and, um, and burning out, man. I mean, and I would, I would look up at these big tall buildings at three in the morning with all the lights out and I'd pound my chest. Like I can outwork anybody like an idiot. And, uh, but you know, I was in my early thirties back when I first started and, um, and I was in that warrior mode. And, but so, um, but I, I, I had been grinding for a few years and realized um, I'm burning out and it's probably sucking for my wife. Um, I got to figure something out. So you, that, that was during the medical, the, the medical uh, drawing company or the medical legal trial presentation company. That was that company. You did all the, yeah, I went, I went hardcore from day one, hit the ground running, like brave heart running across the field with a sword out, like, resolve to make it work. However, whatever it takes, I'm going all in. I'm going to do whatever it takes. However late I got to stay up, however far I have to run in the heat with a suit on, whatever I got to do. Um, <laughs> but after a while, you know, you, you just wear out, you know, like, I mean, it's like years of that pace. And then, um, and then we had our first kid, our first baby. And that's really where it was like, Holy crap, I got to figure something out. And, and so uh, so I promised my wife I'd figure something out. And I actually drove about almost an hour outside of where I was living. Um, just get away with just a, a notepad and a pen. 
And I was like, I'm just going to sit here for however many hours it takes. And I'm going to plan out, uh, like a better way, a better business, better life, just by, just by myself. Um, and, and this all ties in to, to going from, uh, that last business to the next one. But, um, but I sat there for hours and hours and hours and I started figuring it out and experimenting and doing this thing and, and, and trying to optimize that thing. And, and I had this plan and then I went back again a year later, did it again and did it a little better and it got a little better at planning. And after a few years, I was imagining what if we had a, a like a room, a ballroom with all these entrepreneurs and we went through all these questions and took time to think out all this stuff together and brought in some badasses who could share some helpful insights, you know, that, that have the past experience, you know, that we could leverage. And, um, and then I did. So like I sold the company and I, I booked a ballroom. I didn't know if anybody other than my mom was going to show up <laughs> and, and I've, trust me, I was anxious as hell. Cause I was like, Oh God, because outside of like all the lawyers, nobody knew who I was. And um, this, that was the, and that was the beginning of 12 Mavens. Is that, is that, well, right? that was, I did this event and I called it plan the attack, plan the attack. Okay. And I told everybody, it's not called plan a pretty good year. This event is not called plan a year. Kind of like last year, it's called plan the attack and attack on your business attack on your life as an entrepreneur. And, um, and I did that event first and, and with the hope that if, enough people were interested instead of it being one day a year, we could do something more ongoing and kind of what I was imagining, like building a little community. And so a few, there was enough interest. And so a couple months later, we had the first meeting of 12 Mavens, which is what I do now. So plan the attack started out as just your desire to, uh, to get people to really as entrepreneurs really attack like you did when you started the medical. Yeah. It, medical company, yeah, right? it sets out to do the hardest thing for an entrepreneur to do sit still. And that's really the secret sauce is it forces you to sit still disconnected from everything else for an entire day from like the morning until dinner time. There's like, I, when they, people didn't realize it when they got there, I had like an 80 page binder <laughs> for each person with like all blank lines through the whole thing. And they're like, huh? Like, Oh crap, we got to do stuff. And, but we do everything in like three, four minute increments. And we, you know, interacted with each other and stuff. So who, who was the inspiration or what was the inspiration behind you saying, Hey, I just got to get away and think and write, because it sounds like you did that multiple times over several years. Who, who inspired or what inspired you to do that? I think what inspired me to do that was a, a million got a second questions from my staff, from uh, customer client calls, from uh, everything coming at you. You know, I, I remember um, when I was a kid, I went water skiing for the first time. And I was kind of like hoping they didn't even ask me if I wanted to try it. You know, I was rather just hang out on the boat, but I was like, okay. So I get on all my friends have done it and I'm holding on. Right. And the boat's pulling me and I'm going for a little bit and then I fall. But for some reason, I just wasn't letting go of the, the handle thing. And it's just dragging me. My friends are like, let go, you idiot. And I'm just like, <laughs> I know it's like, I felt like if I let go, they're just going to like leave me out here for, you know, I'll be out here for weeks, you know, starving <laughs> instead of like, you know, the boat just turns around and scoops you up. But I was just like, you know, they were like, don't let, like, you know, let go. And, and years later, as I was growing that business, I used to flash to that memory in my head all the time. That feeling of the, the business was that boat. And I was just like too dumb to let go. And it's just pulling me along. And I was just like getting, you know, like beat up in the water, just getting dr dragged along. And, and I, it was just weird. I didn't intentionally connect those. It just, that memory just was like pop into my head because that's what I felt the same feeling. And, and so I was, I, I used to get there at three, four in the morning just because I had so much to do. But I also noticed that I would get more done from four in the morning up till 9 a.m. than I would, you know, for eight hours of just normal hours. That is a 
really, really good story about the boat and a great analogy because you're so right. So many entrepreneurs hold on to the rope. And and what happens is, you know, and I know as, far as someone who's done that and people who are listening have done that. You, you, most of the time, you're not just skimming across the top of the water that you go, that pulls you under like and you're, beat you're up. <laughs> yeah, you get pretty deep under the water and get beat up because you're, you're afraid to let go. And, and it, 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 sorry, it, it, and you might think like, well, this is what skiing's like. This is how it feels. This is what <laughs> you do. And then you see some other person go by you doing like backflips and, landing perfectly and you know whatever but you don't all you know is what you know right and, and so uh but i realize there's got to be a better way uh, i know there's a better way and i mean i would try to consume i wouldn't say there was any one person that told me like get away from your office as much as just like i consumed everything that i could every audio book you know every anything i was gonna say podcast but i don't think there were podcasts yet <laughs> well so you so you, t- tell me about what you did when you were sitting you just you're by yourself it's kind of this little thinking and strategic planning retreat of your by yourself yep what, what yep. did you do what was your method what or was there one or you just kind of sat there with an empty piece of paper and, uh, and- i was that first one i was kind of winging it but uh, I mean, it was like year after year, I would refine it and refine it and refine it. And then we finally did the first event where it was more formalized into a binder. Um, that was in 2013, December, 2013. And I'd say every year it's like, it's gotten a little tweaked a little bit, like maybe well, let's add this, you know, or let's put this thing here in, in, every time. But, but in that first one, I was just thinking really is like, what's all the stuff that I do, you know, what, what are all the things that I'm doing? And then what are the things that I'm doing that I don't have to be the one doing? And, and who else could do those things? Like start like this kind of listing out all of the stuff that I was doing. Um, and then, um, and then like looking at it, like an inventory list of just stuff that I do every day. And then it was, you know, some of it, you'd be embarrassed to show other people that you do yourself. And, and some of it, you could just cut out completely. Really. It doesn't really, really even, it's not even worth doing. And then there's stuff that somebody uh, could probably do for five to $8 an hour in the Philippines. And then there's stuff that, you know, if you just gave, the people on your team, so the training and the tools and some of your time, you could, they could probably get up to speed on it and could take it over. Maybe would even want to take it over. Well, it sounds to me like you created something I refer to as a load list and uh, you know, all the load, everything that's on you. And it's, it's so, it's so cool that we're talking because you and I do so many things like we're doing the same stuff. You're, you're mm-hmm. very successful at it. You've, 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 you've done really well at it and I'm, I'm envious of your success, Damn. but I, but I think it's really cool that what you just described is session one of my group coaching platform that I take <laughs> people through is it's, it's create a load awesome. list because you don't know what you got to get rid of until you know what's on the, on the list. You got to fix You got to make the list first. So that's yeah. it's very, very curious, very curious. Yeah. So, so yeah. you did this. So you did this load list that I, I refer to as load list. You did this mm-hmm. load list. I said to myself, I said, I need to create a load list. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to offload. Actually, the reason I call it a load list, there's this, there's this guy. And when I was working on my doctorate degree, which I didn't, didn't finish by the way, but when I was working on it, I, I studied a guy uh, by the name of Howard Yale McCluskey, who was okay. a sociologist uh, who studied gerontology, which is study of older people. And he had this, he came up with a theory called the theory of power load margin. And, 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 and I'll make this really fast, but essentially what he said was, is that margin can only happen when the power to do stuff exceeds the load. In other words, all the stuff that has to be done. So the power has to exceed the load there. And that's where margin happens. And so he didn't apply it to business, but I took it as like, as, as a coach, as a business person say, Hey, this is a good thing for entrepreneurs to learn. So the power is all the things we get, like, you know, like you said, podcasts, reading books, listen, audio books, listen, watching YouTube channels. That's gives us power. 
And then the load is all the crap we got to get rid of. And then when we, we get power in excess of the load, then we have margin. And that's where success happens. So yeah, that's like why that. I call it, that's why I call it load. Uh, because yeah, of Howard, cool. Howard McCluskey. Well, Shout so out. you did hashtag McCluskey. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. He, uh, he was, uh, I think he wrote that in 19, it was in the sixties or seventies, I think maybe. Um, so it's, it's, I, I don't, I don't think he's with us anymore, but, um, so what, so you did plan the attack. You did this event. What was that first event? Like how many people showed up? Uh, it was cool because like, I'd say two or three weeks before the event, not one person has signed up. And then, and I'm, and I'm, I had, I forget what it was. I think I had to, I was like committed to $10,000 at the, at the ballroom at the, at this, I got a really fancy place and everything full, like breakfast, lunch, everything paid for. Um, I wanted it to be like a really nice day. Um, and, and I remember I was like, had it an area where, where, um, companies that offered, uh, services that entrepreneurs would benefit from could, could have like a little table and stuff and, and they could be sponsors. And I remember, so there's nobody, literally it's a few weeks away, zero sponsors, zero attendees. And I'm like ready to puke on myself. And, um, (laughs) and I remember on the same day I got a sponsor and a first attendee, which really made me want to puke all over myself because I could have just quietly like never done the event and nobody would have even remembered or noticed, but I was like, Oh God, how embarrassing. Now I've got an attendee and a sponsor. And I remember thinking, Oh, I'll introduce them to each other. You know, I'll make sure they meet each other when like I'll I'll introduce the attendee to the sponsor. (laughs) But, uh, but then over the, over those last few weeks, um, it, it ended up going to, I think we had 40 or 50, people in the room, which was pretty cool. Cause I had, I was nervous. I booked a room that could hold like 30 or something. And then we ended up moving into the next room over, which was luckily still available. Hey, we're going to take a break from today's show to bring you a message from our sponsor, which is Dub. I am a proud user of Dub, and I have been using them for a long time. As a matter of fact, you might have seen my face on some of their video advertisements on Facebook and LinkedIn, but I am a Dub user, and I'm proud to say that they are a sponsor of The Root of All Success. So Dub offers a suite of video creation, distribution, and tracking tools where you can engage your prospects and increase your revenue. So think about this. This, you can send an email that has a video built right into it and they can play right from there and double track. Did they see it? Did they watch it? Did they click on it? You can put calls to action at the end of the video. It's an amazing tool that will increase your transactions and your reactions in your emails. You'll actually get people interacting with what you've got going on and converting them to actually taking action. They have a Chrome extension. There's a desktop app, a mobile app. It integrates with LinkedIn. You can actually send videos, messages through LinkedIn. You can even create, share, and track videos from your favorite project manager tool like Asana. And now shooting a video is even easier than typing, right? I mean, you can shoot a video quicker than you can type a message, so you shoot the video and send it out. They even transcribe your videos. No need to pay for transcription services. Dub's got you covered. They have YouTube integration. I mean, think about this, making a YouTube video actionable. So you take the video you put on YouTube, you drop it into Dub, and then send that video out instead. And it's got action items, clickables. You can click into it. You can respond to it but you don't lose your YouTube plays. YouTube still records that it was a play. You can drive more engagement and conversions with Dub than you can anywhere else. You can get a video landing page that you can use on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. I can't recommend Dub more highly than I'm doing right now, and I'm so glad that they're a sponsor of this episode. So if you want two free weeks of Dub plus two months at 50% off, that's 50% off your first two months, go to therealjasonduncan.com slash Dub. That's D-U-B-B, therealjasonduncan.com slash dub. Thanks so much to Dub and the guys over there for sponsoring today's episode. And let's get back to the show. So you, how, what was your ticket price on that? Uh, I think it was probably about 500 bucks. Oh, so 500 bucks. You had 40. It was, a thou- it was $1,000. But if you registered in advance, I was willing to do it for 50%, which was 500. Okay. And, but, it, but we filled up all the spots. And so nobody paid, had to pay the like last minute price. So it was 500. Okay. So 500 times five, it's 50 people. You know, so it's 25 grand. 
uh, covers your cost of doing the event, maybe some sponsorships there too. And uh, it was good enough for you to continue doing that. You actually made that a thing, right? Yeah, for sure. And for me, it wasn't like, I mean, I, if I broke even, I would have been thrilled. It was, it wasn't at all about the, the revenue or the profit at all. I mean, I was, you know, obviously an entrepreneur don't want to do something that you don't think you have a chance to, you know, have that happen. But, but I was purely, I just wanted to make that event go from something I thought about for years to like an actual day. And I mean, it was amazing. It was like amazing. At the end of the day, I was like trying to say my last few words without crying. And, and my wife and I were like celebrating after it was over. And I was just like, one of those times where just like, that was amazing. It was amazing. What year was this? 2013, December, right. 2013. So December of 13, you, you do the first plan, plan the attack. Um, and then where did the idea of the, the group, the 12 Mavens group come from? Yeah, I had that. I had that idea. I mean, it was it, it was out of necessity, like back a few years before that, as I was growing and I was, you know, holding on to the, the boat metaphorically. I remember making, you know, I, I, I was growing really fast and I was in Fortune magazine and CNN money and all this stuff, which makes you, you know, guns blazing, except you know, it was a bumpy, it was a bumpy ride. Growing really fast can be really expensive and it can be super stressful. And I knew that I would, I would, you know, I would try things that could explode. Like I remember, uh, you know, doing something I thought for sure would work out and burning six figures in a few months of like actual cash, not pipeline or perceived value, like actual money in the bank, like burning it. And I was like in my early thirties and that was like devastating. And, um, uh, and I remember thinking, damn it, if I had just reached out to other smart, successful entrepreneurs, maybe a couple years further along than me, I know that they would have saw all the holes in my plan and they would have like asked me questions that would make me think, Oh, that's true. Oh yeah. And so I ended up putting together a group, of really smart, successful entrepreneurs that I admired. We were all about the same age, but they were just badasses, just crushing it. Uh, and um, like, I mean, like some of them have had like multiple hundreds of million dollar exits since since then. But I put together this insane group of like really six smart entrepreneurs and we started meeting together. Um, can I say a semi bad word? Yeah. It's up to you. Uh, okay. Um, but we called ourselves, um, it was achieving success simultaneously helping others learn, evolve and succeed or just a S S H O L E S for short. <laughs> But it was kind of funny because we, you know, we'd introduce each other, like we'd run into one of the other members and and their spouse and be like, oh, this, you know, so the guy would be like, oh, this is Jeff. He's a guy who started, he's like one of the assholes, should I say? That? <laughs> but, um, That's but, awesome. but we did it, but except it was just casual, was just, you know, we'd go, and we'd maybe have some drinks and we'd end up maybe talking about the Super Bowl. Or I remember one time two guys were talking about a hair loss prevention <laughs> remedy for like, 25 minutes. And I was thinking, you know, I'd rather be watching a movie with my wife, you know, if we're just going to sit here and do this, I want to, I want to have conversations that are going to help me mitigate risks that are going to help me grow my business. They're going to help me reduce the stress I'm feeling. And, and, and sometimes only two of us would show up. Sometimes we go three, four months without doing a meeting until one of us ran into another one and be like, yeah, we need to get together. You know, it was too casual. Um, or sometimes, we'd spend the whole night talking about like one person's problem. And then these two that had a really bad problem, never even got a chance to, um, to, to get helped. And so I remember during those meetings thinking if I ever sold this business and could do whatever I want, I would love to do something like this, but with structure, with a framework, um, more professional, you know, and, 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 and really try to make it to make it, do it in a way where making sure everybody's going to get value out of it. Well, what it seems like to me is that, you know, I'm looking at, looking at your 12 Mavens uh, website 
is that it's dedicated to the idea of there's these entrepreneurs and CEOs are are in the weeds. They're stuck. They're running, running 80 plus, just like you did, 80 plus hours a week, beating their chest that they're out working everybody else when they're really not living their ideal lives. They're not living the life that they thought that entrepreneurship should be able to provide them as going right. back to your boat analogy, they're being drugged behind the boat. And while yeah. somebody else is doing the backflips next to them and they don't understand and 12 Maven seems to be an opportunity for people to join something to learn how to get out of that, that struggle. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's what's been amazing to me is seeing highly successful entrepreneurs that still get a ton out of it. You know, it's like nobody's, at the finish line, there's always something you can get better at or learn more about, or, you know, you know, no, no smart entrepreneur is as smart as a whole group of smart entrepreneurs combined together. It's like, when you think of your biggest challenge, your biggest frustration, and you put it out there for others and you say like, I'm trying to figure out the best way to whatever. And then you have all these different people and all these different industries, all you know, bouncing ideas off of, off of each other and, and like adding to the last comment. And it, it just gives you access to things you just would have never had access to. I, I mean, I think when somebody says that something amazing that happened after plan the attack, you know, it feels good, but I also know really the hero is that they took that much time to just think about all that stuff and actually write it down in, in a 12 Mavens meeting. The hero isn't, the, the, I mean, you want to have a good facilitator, but it's, it's the power of multiple brains combined together. You know, do you, do you consider 12 Mavens to be a, uh, a traditional mastermind or do you refer to it as something different? I, I don't know. I mean, I use the word, there's so many ways to describe it. A mastermind, a peer group, a round table. Uh, I don't really have a lot of experience in other groups. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, there's some that have similarities and some that are a different, I'm sure there's, you know, they all have, all have the thing in common is leveraging the combined brain power of, of multiple ideas. Yeah. That's yeah well, common. The way they do it is, it could be really different. So what, uh, what do you, what do you define success as? I mean, what you've been successful in a lot of different things. Uh, how, how does Jeff Davis define that word success? That's a great question. And I think it's important that people don't feel like any other person's definition of success is what has to be their definition, right? So you could hear a successful person talk about what success is and you have to, you know, it could be true and it could be right, but it also could be not success for you because uh, I, I know for me personally, I never wanted to be um celebrating revenue with wife number six, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be uh, like pounding my chest about how big my company was and I'm completely out of shape and I, I get tired after walking like down the street. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to die younger than I could have if I didn't have so much stress in my life, you know, but, but, you know, there are as many different ways to be successful as there are successful people. So to answer your question for me, only speaking for myself, success is being genuinely happy in your life. So with that, whatever that means to you, well, so with that as a definition, which I don't, I don't disagree with, um, and certainly all of your lead up is very much uh, appreciated to, to that answer. But with that as your definition of success, are you a successful person? Yes, I am successful. But, and, and for me also my, to elaborate more on, on success, because I have friends that have way more money than me for sure. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and it, it, it is easy to like walk into an 11,000 square foot house on the water with an elevator and kind of feel like, oh, uh, I'm a loser, you know, just like a knee jerk reaction when you do it. But then but then you're like, I've spent more time with my kids than probably ninety nine point nine percent of the dads on the planet. Maybe half of them wouldn't want to. <laughs> but for me, that was what winning looked like to, you know, to be able to have all these adventures together 
to be able to go around the world together. Um, but I think it's important also to mention that there is no perfect like unicorns and rainbows for anybody every day, all day. So I say, yes, I am successful, but for sure I could get an email that's like breaks my heart or like makes me feel like I'm not being successful, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it, it changes. And, and I appreciate you, you, your lead up to your answer is that it success is very much a personal thing. There, there's a dictionary definition of success in terms of just getting the results that you hope for. What they say, what's Webster's got to say? Yeah. The, you know, it's the, but, but, but for all of us, the results that we hope for are very different, you know, and I admire yeah. what you're doing with your kids. I, I'm very much a family focused guy. My wife's number one, my kids are right there. You know, that my family is the most important thing. And, and, and so for me, that's that is part of success for me. Uh, but another person may say, until I own that new Ferrari, I'm not successful. Or until I own that eleven thousand square foot house on the lake, I'm I'm not successful. But but and that's fine if that's their and, definition. And if it. I can, so, and I will say for the people that feel like until I get that Ferrari, I won't be successful. Uh, I sold my company and I bought a Maserati with a Ferrari engine, and I remember parking it at, you know, I'm feeling like I'm feeling, you know, I checked that box or whatever. And I parked it at my kid's school at the time, which was kind of a fancy school. And I remember a guy parking his Maserati right next to me, like another dad that was like a little bit fancier version, maybe. And, and thinking like, Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not as good as his, you know, or whatever, but it's like, you know, there's always a fancier car. Comparison. Comparison is comparison is such a thief to joy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It robs our joy of so many I things because cool. there's lots of memes and pictures on, on Instagram and other places where it shows one person being very happy with their bicycle, you know, riding down the street to next to a person who's in a car, uh, who's looking at the guy in the Ferrari, who's looking at the guy in the helicopter. And then there's just all these different perspectives of what you've got. And, and that yeah. comparison is it will rob us of joy. And I wish that I could just flip a switch in my brain to not give a blank about whatever the people think, but it, it, it doesn't work that way. And I'm you said working. We can say it. bad words. Yeah. Well, I'm okay. just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tell my kids, keep, I tell my ready. my kids are older now, but I tell my kids there are no good words. There are no bad words. They're just words used inappropriately. <laughs> so, uh, you know, fair. well, to do that, let, let, let's, do, I want to ask you something specific about um, okay. these seven particular things. Yep. This is what I talked about in, in your intro is that this this life changing leap from being stuck in the weeds to really fulfilling your vision is based on these seven particular things. So I don't want to go deep, obviously, but but what what are these seven particular things? Yeah. And 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 some of them were kind of interwoven. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Interwoven into sort of my story. And, and like the first thing that I did was I mapped out a detailed plan. So it wasn't just kind of in my head. It wasn't, I'm just sort of thinking I, I need to do this. Or I'm going to do it. It was like, I actually went and mapped out a plan. Maybe it's going to be re revised and, and improved, you know, as you go, but, but I had a plan. Um, and then the second thing I did was I started to, you know, build out a support team. And, and, uh, and that was, you know, one of the things I mentioned about, you know, if other people, get the tools and the training and some of your time to, to learn how to do some of these things um, or to outsource it or, um, you know, the other people that can take some of this weight off of you. Um, uh, and then in that process is usually when you learn that you suck at delegating because this one didn't, you know, this one's taken forever to do it. And this one did it, didn't do it the way I wanted. And then actually taking time to master the art and science of delegation. And I mean, it is, there are trainable ways to delegate more effectively than if you just say here, I, can you do this? You know? Um, and then uh, another big thing was actually systematizing the way the business ran. That's what's so great about a franchise is that's what you're buying is it's all figured out. Here's exactly how everything uh, works and how like 
some franchises can have a bunch of 16 year olds running a like $2 million operation, you know, because it's so systematized and, and, and forget where most entrepreneurs we're more like a visionary thinker and we got an idea. And when it comes to like the details, we're just completely uninterested, like managing it, actually like measuring it. We're like, eh. but that's why it's a lot of times it's good to offset that type of person with like a, a execution operations type of person. Um, but if you don't have that other person, you know, you're, it's a lot harder, but um but uh, systematizing, figuring out what is the process? What, what is the way that we generate leads? What is the way that somebody should let you know they're not coming into the office today? What is the, the way that we uh, handle our accounts receivables? What is the way, you know, like step by step um, uh, so that you could, your business could be a franchise, even if you don't want to, but it is, it, it's, built so that it could be. Um, and then, uh, you know, making the time to learn how to do all the kind of stuff that we're talking about. So like I, co I commend people that take the time to listen to stuff like this and level up, you know, you never know that one little tiny tweak in how you're doing something that you pick up from something like this could, could end up being life changing. I've seen that happen so many times, but making the time to look, to continue to learn, um, that would be the fifth thing. And then the sixth thing um, is uh, to get over the guilt of, you know, if you've had like me, your years of being first in last out, you could have guilt issues where you feel like you have to be first one in and last out. You know, I've always believed in like lead from the front kind of mentality, but at the same time, if you've taken the risk and you've done, put in all the work, then, you know, the, the, the benefits, the privileges um, of that hard work, you know, it, it should be there as well. Um, so get over the guilt or the ego feeling like I'm the star of the team. And, and, you know, it's like if the star football player gets hurt and then the team can't win without them, that's not a good team. That's not a good coach. That's not a good organization. Um, so get over it and, and, and hope that they do it better than you. And, um, you know, don't let your ego, sometimes people almost subconsciously can self-sabotage because they're almost subconsciously afraid that they won't be as much of the star as they yeah. thought that they had to be. Um, and which kind of goes to like the limiting beliefs, get, you know, just get over the guilt, ego, limiting beliefs. Um, and then the seventh thing is leveraging other entrepreneurs and CEOs hindsight, and, and, and the power of group thinking combined with some accountability. Um, there's, there's no explaining our indifference to ourselves. We'll do like a die for our family and, and, and uh, we'll work these hours that we would never ask an employee to work, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but, uh, but uh everybody has learned things the hard way. Um, sometimes you can, you can benefit so much from somebody's really bad experience. Um, and as I said, no one's as smart as a whole bunch of smart people combined together. So I love it. Uh, what's, what's really funny. And I, I wrote all these down uh, is that folks who are familiar with my, uh, my platform will know that, your seven steps and my four, they intersect in so many places. You you say yeah. in step number number six, get over the ego. I call that the hero syndrome. And that, you know, that we've got to we gotta solve everything all the time. And then your third step about mastering delegation is my first step. It's like a, you got to embrace delegation. And I actually teach, as you talk, talked about, that there are ways to learn how to do it because so many entrepreneurs either abdicate or confiscate. They think they're delegate, even though they rhyme, they don't. <laughs> I can, my, <laughs> rhyme my is TED, not good enough. <laughs> yeah. My TED, my TED talk this past year was uh, actually on delegation. And I talked about that, that specific there thing. You so go. so, so let me, let me review these for everybody listening out. So, so number one, map out a detailed plan. Number Number two, build a support team. Number three, master the art of delegation. Number four, put systems in place, systematize everything. Number five, make time to learn, to, 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 to sit down and do it and learn how to do it. 
Six, get over the guilt and the ego, or as I call it, the hero syndrome. And the number seven, leverage other people's insights. And yeah. so Jeff just figured out if you do these seven things, you get out of the weeds, you can move on to that ideal life. And, and yeah. he and I are telling the same story, man. And you this sure is, can. Yeah. And, and, and you, you can't, don't expect it to just go like perfectly smooth. It's, you know, I, I have a, I bought a t-shirt one time that says destiny comes on broken wings. And to me that, that meant that like, your destiny is there, but it's like sometimes you get there a little bit, a little bit beat up and it's never quite as romantic as, you know, the journey as, as you imagine, but, but you can for sure get there. If I went from working every single night, every single weekend, I mean, I would have dinner and go back to work for hours and hours. And I remember to me, like the dream life would be working my ass off all day having dinner and then not having to do anything else for the rest of the night. Like to me, that was a fantasy. Like I couldn't imagine it. And yeah, like you said, I'm in the South of France, you know, um, and I'm able to go sit at a, you know, hang out and, and, but still do stuff work. I like too. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all your success. Uh, your definition is being genuinely happy. And I, I agree that that is a metric for success that people should embrace. So thank you for your perspective. Thank you for being on the show. I'm going to give you the opportunity to have the last word to say, um, you know, what, what advice would you give that early stage entrepreneur? So we've got entrepreneurs that are listening that are all over the board, very okay. successful, very in early. So if you had to speak a word of advice as you finish up this show with me today, what is your word of advice for those people in the early stages? The people for the early stages of entrepreneurship, I would say it it's takes a lot of hard work. I've picked the brains like you have. I've picked the brains of a lot of really successful people. And I can't tell you how many times those two words came up when I was, when I was the young entrepreneur seeking a, a advice. And, and it is true, but, uh, but if you are willing to work hard and pay your dues and you know, it's going to be like that scene in Braveheart probably for the whole first year of, you know, having that sort out. Um, the, you can for sure find a way or make one, but, but I would say it's, you gotta be doing something that's worth it because you do eat a lot of poop sandwiches on that ride <laughs> and you gotta do, you gotta be building something that is worth eating poop sandwiches. Does that make sense? So 100%. if you're just trying to chase some random thing, just because it seems like maybe it'll make money, but you don't really care. You're not really that into it. it you know, after you're eating poop sandwiches every day, you're going to be like, you're going to quit. And it takes a lot of dark uh, moments where you're not sure if you're going to be able to make it sometimes. So make sure it's worth it. Well, thank you for that. And you are offering for all the listeners a free 30 minute strategy session. If they want to work with you on how to achieve their net goals, their top objectives, biggest obstacles, deal with frustrations, all that. We're going to put the link to that in the show notes. It's a calendar link and uh, I could, I could read it to everybody, but it, it's going to be almost impossible to, well, you know what I'll do it just for those that are never going to look at the show notes. It's calendly.com slash Jeff as in Jeff Davis dash four, seven, one. So Jeff dash four, seven, one slash strategy hyphen session. So again, very difficult to remember. I'll, I'll say it one more right, time. Yeah. Calendly.com slash Jeff dash 471 slash strategy hyphen session. So we're going to put that in the show notes. So Jeff's giving that away free to, to podcast listeners that are listening to the root of all success. And, and Jeff, I very much appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you being on the show today. It's been an honor to talk to you. Enjoy the rest of your world tour as you're uh, doing your victory lap and uh, hopefully yeah. we'll run into each other again in the near future. Yeah, for sure, man. We'll make sure we do. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Another very successful entrepreneur about his story of success. And what's interesting about this show today is how much Jeff's story and my story are similar in that what we do. And there's a lot of things that, that kind of coincide and overlap, but what I think you should take away from this show today with what Jeff is talking about is that what he's doing and what I'm doing 
match, which means this is possible. And there is a method to this madness of getting out of the weeds. You don't have to work 80 hours a week. You don't have to be the hero. You don't have to do everything. And so his seven step plan and my four step plan, very similar, very similar to how those things work. And I'm going to, you heard me review those right there at the end of the show. So I'm not going to do it again, but you can go back and rewind and listen to that, but reach out, go, go take, go take a look at Jeff. You can follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, he's on LinkedIn. You can look at him up at 12 mavens.com. And the, and the 12 is just as the numbers, not don't spell out the word 12 It's one, two mavens.com, but go check them out. It's a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting peer group that you can get involved in to help you get to that place. And of course, I do the same thing. I do it a little different than he does, but we're aiming for the same goal. And that's to get you out of the weeds, get you out of the daily operations of the business. And maybe you're wondering, am I even ready to do that? Well, let me offer something to you. Go to amireadytoexit.com. Amireadytoexit.com. And there is a 100% free exit readiness assessment that I, we, my team and I created this to help entrepreneurs like you figure out what, where am I in this timeline? Am I six months away? Am I six years away? When would I be able to get out of the weeds? What do I, what, what might I need to do to get myself to that place? And so that you get a customized report free, all free, go to am I ready to exit.com to find out if in fact you are ready to exit. Well, tune in again next week when I talk with yet another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, I am the real Jason Duncan and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Follow Jason on social media at The Real Jason Duncan. Are you an entrepreneur who feels trapped in the weeds of daily operations, not experiencing the freedom you thought you'd have as a business owner? Want to know the way out? Take Jason's free exit readiness assessment to see how close you are to getting ready to experience true freedom and success as an entrepreneur. Go to amireadytoexit.com today. That's amireadytoexit.com. See you again next time here on The Root of All Success.